place it at your service. Jason suggests strapping out a coat before you head outside. Yes, it is going to be breezy today, but not as breezy as yesterday. Although the temperature will be cooler, it might feel a bit nicer outside at 55 degrees. 61 tomorrow. Good chance of rain both Friday and Saturday, but Saturday evening at this point looks dry, as does Sunday. 63 Monday, another chance of rain uh, Tuesday with a high temperature of uh, 60 degrees. You know they say climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. We talked to someone who studies the climate, uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe yesterday. She'll be speaking tonight at the Memorial Union at Iowa State University, and uh, she talked uh, with me yesterday about uh, climate change, and here's what she had to say. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe joins us. She is the head of climate science at Texas Tech University. Thank you for being here on short notice. So we saw the topic of your conversation. It's a hot one and we wanted to get you in here. You'll be speaking tonight uh, at Iowa State University, the Memorial Union, which many of you are familiar with at seven o'clock. And tell us what you'll be speaking about. I'm going to be speaking about climate change. Mm -hmm. I am a climate scientist, but I'm going to be coming at it from a bit of a different angle. Okay. I'm not talking about how the world's going to end. Okay. I'm not talking about how we have to all hug trees or mm -hmm. love Al Gore. <laughs> As he flies around the world in his private jet. Exactly, right. yes. What I'm going to talk about is how climate change, first of all, offers some urgent challenges for Iowa that we need to know about, mm -hmm. but it also offers some incredible opportunities to Iowa that we need to be ready to take advantage of. Let's get some housekeeping out of the way because we're going to have uh, people on both sides of, of this hot topic. Climate science, um, uh, climate models for the future say the temperature will go like this. Satellite measurements are going like this. What, what's been happening over the recent time span that the temperature isn't rising as quickly as we would anticipate? Well, first of all, I'm glad you said housekeeping mm. because the April issue of Good Housekeeping magazine, <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, uh -huh. has a whole section on climate myths, climate science 101, and what's happening around the country and why we care. Okay. So if you have a chance, get out there there and pick up the April issue of Good Housekeeping before it's gone okay? because it answers a lot of these questions. Okay. Bottom line is though, when you look at the climate models and you look at what's happening in the world today, mm -hmm. there is an incredible match between what we see happening. Even more so when we look over appropriate time scales, which is at least 20 to 30 years, because we have to make sure all the weather variations kind of even out. Mm -hmm. When we look over 20 to 30 years, we see that the climate models are actually conservative. Really? in that they are underestimating the rate of change that we're seeing in many of our systems around the world. There's only one way that you can get observed temperatures that are below every single model prediction, and that's if you fudge the data, I hate to say. Okay, I just saw today that, is it uh, Mauna Kea, is that how you pronounce it? They mm -hmm. just measured the highest uh, carbon concentration in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide that they'd ever measured. That came out this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we think of climate change, we, we think of uh, the oceans rising. I don't know how you argue that they're not. Uh, we think of the Arctic warming, but, but how will it affect us here in Iowa? Well, even if we threw out all of our thermometer measurements and all of our satellite measurements and all of our science, mm. we could still see climate changing in our own backyards. Because as you just said, you know, with sea level and with glaciers and with ice and also with when the plants bloom, how long the growing season is, how our rainfall patterns are changing, mm -hmm. what types of bugs and pests and insects we're seeing here, mm -hmm. we're seeing over 26 and a half thousand lines of evidence that the climate is warming. Okay. And like I said, a lot of them we're seeing here. So we're seeing our growing zones shifting. Mm -hmm. We're seeing our rainfall patterns changing. Our rain is going up here in Iowa, mm -hmm. and it's also getting more variable. And you've probably seen that yourself too, right? I know at Iowa State, uh, they found that uh, certainly we have uh, uh, more heavy rain events than we used to here. Exactly, and that increases the risk of flooding, mm -hmm. which we all care about. Mm -hmm. If we've ever been flooded, I don't know. I have, have you? Uh, I have not personally, but I've seen what it does, and it's it's awful. Oh yeah, I had three feet of raw sewage in our basement one time. Oh. It was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so you know about flooding. Yes, I do. So these are the things that we're seeing happen. We're seeing things happen that actually affect our lives. Up in Minnesota, they're in insurance rates have gone up over 200% because of the increased flood risk that they've seen over just the last 10 years. 
So anybody who depends on temperature or rainfall in any way, which includes, of course, farmers and producers, but also includes business people, and just you and I who have to pay our bills, that's why we care about climate change, because it affects us. Let's say that, that all this is true, and, and certainly you've, uh, evidence suggests that it is. Uh, we crank out so much carbon with industry here in the United States, and probably more so in China, India, other places. Is there anything we could do about it anyway, uh, even if, you know, we assume that it is happening? I would say that's the number one question mm -hmm. that I hear people say is, you know, even if we did everything we could, it doesn't matter because China is producing more and more carbon every year. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing though, and this is crazy. Last year, China reduced their carbon emissions for the first time ever. They are cutting their carbon emissions. China has 50% more wind installed than the United States. They're number one in the world in wind. Wow. China's number two in the world in solar after Germany. United States is number five. Wow. So it's no longer a case of we could do everything that, you know, that we can and you know, China will just be over there messing it up anyways. It's a case of we're losing the clean energy economy race to China. So this is a, and we've seen it in Iowa, an opportunity to, to generate income. Uh, we have uh, maybe not as big an opportunity for solar here as you might farther south, but certainly one. A lot of opportunity, and, and we've seen it here, the growth of wind energy, uh, uh, ethanol, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, cellulosic ethanol. Bio Biofuels. Biofuels. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were talking before this segment, I mean, Iowa could really become the Middle East of the Midwest. There's a lot of opportunity here with clean energy. Oh, yeah. I mean, even if we don't agree on whether climate is changing, and recent surveys show that most of us around the U.S. do agree that climate is changing, less of us would agree that it's mostly because of human activities, although when we look at the science, it's pretty clear that natural cycles are important, mm. volcanoes are important, the sun's important, El Nino's important, but when we look at all these things, they have an alibi. And mm. we're going to be talking about that in more detail tonight, about how do we know these things have an alibi. But even if we don't agree on the cause of climate change, most of us can agree on the solutions because the solutions just make sense. Mm -hmm. It's about investing in the economy that we have right here, growing our energy here, providing it across the U.S., and also innovative new ways to bring agriculture into the picture. So that rather than being, you know, vilified as, oh, do you terrible people are producing all this carbon, agriculture actually has the potential to save the day here in Iowa. Can we replace the energy produced by fossil fuels in, let's say, when we use it for manufacturing or construction or, or air travel, that kind of power, that kind of horsepower, can we replace that energy with uh, renewable energy? There's no one magic bullet that can fix everything. I wish there were. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of little bullets that we can use. So just for example, um, Continental Airlines, back before they got absorbed into United, they actually ran some commercial jets on biofuel without modifying the engine at all. So yes, you can run airplanes on biofuel, mm -hmm. which you can make right here in Iowa. One of the objections that you've heard, and you live in West Texas, is uh, that uh, biofuels are all subsidized. Uh, and that this is a bad thing. What, what is your mm -hmm. response to that? Well, part of it is we're not using everything we could be using for biofuels. One mm. of the main things that people are talking about here in Iowa and that Iowa State is doing research on is using our waste products to make biofuel. You can burn the waste products together with coal and radically reduce the carbon emissions. Okay. You can use the waste products to make these biofuels too. And you're talking about what's left after the corn is harvested, yeah. cob stocks and things like and that. And we're talking really about doing what our grandparents did. Right. You know, waste not, want not. Right. And you come at this, um, and you alluded to this at the beginning, uh, also as a Christian, kind of a caretaker of the earth. I do. My husband's a pastor. I go to an evangelical church in West Texas. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up partly in South America where my parents were missionaries with the local church there. Wow. And so a big part of why I do what I do is because I see not just a scientific mandate, you know, mm -hmm. this is a big problem that we need to work on. I see not just a moral mandate that it's the right thing to do to make sure we're prepared for these changes we're seeing in the future, but I really have um, a, a mandate for my faith that I believe that God created the world, that in Genesis 1 it says that God gave this world, every living thing in it, to us humans to take care of. Of. So we're not usurping the role of God in any way. God actually gave us responsibility for this planet. And it's not just about caring for animals and plants and the planet. It's about caring for people. 
because people, we, us humans, we're the most vulnerable species on the planet to climate change after the polar bear. Mm. I mean, the polar bear is basically the canary in the mine saying, look out people, here's what's coming to you if you don't take care. Because, you know, if, if climate were changing a thousand years ago, you know, and climate has certainly changed in the past for sure. natural reasons, we all know that. If climate were changing and sea level were going up three feet and you lived in New Orleans or Houston or Shanghai, what would you do a thousand years ago? Move. Pick up the tent, move. Right. Yeah. If our main food source were caribou and the caribou migrated 300 miles north, what would we do? Pick up the tents and move. Right. We can't do that today. Mm -hmm. And that's why we care about climate change because we've got two thirds of the world's biggest cities within just a few feet of sea level. Hmm. We've got all of our agricultural areas mapped out. So, you know, if I'm a cotton farmer in West Texas and the best place to go cotton shifts up into Oklahoma and even further north of that, we can't just pick up our farm and move it. It belongs to somebody else up there. Right. That's why we're vulnerable to climate because we've built it into our systems. Tonight at seven o'clock, Iowa State, uh, the Memorial Union. Now, if you can't make it, uh, you can also mm -hmm. follow along online, ask questions, and it'll be streamed live online as well. On Twitter, you can follow along at, uh, at ISU Agronomy. Doctor, thank you very much for being with us on such short notice. It was great to talk to you, and I hope you have a good stay here. We'll be right back with more.